racial literacy and rural solidarity. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, I talk with two pairs of young activists about their work. Jessica Campbell of the Rural Organizing Project in Oregon and Lou Murray of the Stay Together Appalachia Project share tips on combating the right in rural communities. And Winona Go and Priya Volci share their high school project, a crowdsourced racial literacy curriculum. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. Jessica Campbell of the Rural Organizing Project in Oregon and Lou Murray of the Stay Together Appalachia Youth Project may live thousands of miles apart, but their work brought them both to the Southern Movement Assemblies in North Carolina last November, where they discovered they share a lot. I sat down with them both to learn about their work and why they fight for rather than flee their rural home places. That's coming up. There's just been so many similarities between rural Oregon and rural Appalachia, and it's really hard to kind of get to those similarities sometimes because Oregon is seen as this progressive utopia. It's not really understood just what it means to be living in rural Oregon with all this generational poverty that often goes unrecognized because we do have some specks of blue in the state. White supremacists coming into our community because they see these rural spaces like Oregon and Appalachia, they very much are seeing these spaces as spaces that they can occupy and like run people for office. They want our regions, our rural spaces, and so that work is really exciting that y'all are doing to like combat that because I think it's been a, happening there a little longer um, or happening openly a little longer. You know, a bunch of fake cowboys came to Oregon to take over a bird sanctuary. They were really claiming that that land was theirs. And there was this whole narrative that really played out that was actually really damaging to the community, like the community all this time later is still kind of irreparably damaged by it. This idea that people are in support of people taking over a refuge and taking over a community and threatening people who disagree with them and the folks who are opposed to it. And it completely eliminated any kind of conversation around the Burns Paiute tribe, who, if you really want to talk about whose land that is, right? And uh, even with the Burns Paiute tribe having all these, they had a really brilliant press conference where they were talking about, it was actually on the anniversary of them being marched forcibly off their land. And they were eventually given a very small parcel of land to be their new reservation, and it was on the old city dump. They had rights to be out there on the refuge, and uh, you know, folks in the community really heard that, but that wasn't a narrative that was ever picked up or really amplified in any real way. And you know, we tried our best, but it was such a national and international media circus, it really was difficult. Um, but what has resulted in, within the community in Harney County, for example, is there's just this incredible narrative that's developing where folks are really recognizing the tribe. You know, there was a lot of separation before and now there's way more communication and um, somewhat more unity where folks are really like in relationship and talking about what does it mean to actually live on this land together for the long term and what does it mean to do that in a way where everyone can be safe and healthy. I think that there is this idea of economic anxiety or economic hardship. I think they're targeting young white men in, in particular and um, like in spaces like where there have been extractive industries like coal and then the jobs have gone. They're going in and they're, they're using, I mean, traditional workers party. They're using a lot of our movement language but they're talking about like we want solidarity and we want like we want these things but only for white people. You know, and so it's resonating with people. We similarly have a lot of extraction, especially in Western Oregon around timber. Especially when you're in a community that's predominantly white and you don't see a lot of folks of color, it's really easy to be like, yeah, those people, because if you don't have a relationship sometimes. And it completely erases, like, there are people of color who've been working in these industries for a long time. Absolutely. In mining industries, there's like in large mining. Syrian communities in West Virginia that were, came and worked on the mines, Italian communities. In Tennessee, is all about like mining 
minor, white miners in solidarity with black miners who were being forced to work convict labor, basically, conscripted labor. Mm -hmm. And so like that whole history is erased by these kind of these groups and say like, well, it's only white people who do these jobs. Absolutely. So like we're, they're trying to play into that. And it's that whole separation that I think is happening nationwide of like talking about working class and that being coded language for white working class mm -hmm. and not not having like folks of color included in that. And they see, because there's been, I think these narratives about our regions where it's been, that the like have been predominantly about white people, the folks of color who've been doing work in our region, who live in our regions, in our rural areas, are completely erased from it. So it makes it very attractive to these white supremacist groups too. They see mm -hmm. it and they're like, oh, there's a bunch of white people we're gonna go in. We come from a long history of having Aryan Nation organizers and folks trying to set up their, you know, kind of their home base in Oregon and multiple iterations of communities actually having to be like, uh-uh, um, and having to do it really publicly. And one of the lessons that I learned from folks out in Josephine County, which, you know, the Patriots took over uh, the bird sanctuary, but a year prior they had done a takeover around gold mine on public land that got no national coverage. So we really dug in deep in that county and folks in that county were talking about work that ROP had done 20 years ago where they brought a former Aryan Nation recruiter to town um, who had you know, left the movement, left that group, and was talking about how they were recruiting. And part of what he was sharing was they will drop flyers in a community and if no one responds, they know that that community is either not going to react because they're so isolated or they're terrified. Either way, it's an opportunity for them to organize. If there was some kind of a response, they wouldn't show up. And what we really saw is that really did work. And part of what we saw that worked around that is, for example, with the paramilitaries and, you know, to some extent, the neo-Nazi folks that are kind of having their heyday in Oregon right now, is that they are pulling in support from outside of the state and outside of the community. And they have a narrative for their people and for their movement, which is we're gonna go save these people. Yeah. And so the moment that the community's like, actually, we don't need saving, their narrative falls apart, and so they can't mobilize any more people and resources. But, you know, Oregon was really settled by former Confederates who were fleeing, and so, you know, as soon as I got the opportunity to come out south, out to the real south, not out south, yeah. we're being called out south, uh, it was just, I was immediately just drawn to the amount of movement history that is captured here, which is so very different than the Northwest. And the similarities were so rife. I mean, I could count just as many Confederate flags in rural Oregon as I could in rural Kentucky driving through the last few times I've been there. While we have struggles that are safe, there's also some really beautiful cultural ties that are like make our communities really special that are similar too. I noticed yeah. that when I was out in Oregon was there was a lot of similarities. Like, oh, I know this ballad. Like that's one I know from home. There's a lot of cultural music that share mm -hmm. like fiddle music and and tunes and like this kind of like the way we gather is really like that is like this really important connection like uh, and I think that's a rural thing in general but I think there is like a connection between like if we had shared music and shared traditions um, mm -hmm. around gathering spaces gathering around music and gathering around like food and like other things like that uh, that is exciting for me to make I don't know, which is cool. Especially in rural communities, you, no one's expendable. You need everyone you can get, which means that you are doing a lot of deep relationship building. Everything's really place-based. You're doing a lot of storytelling in order to yeah. figure out like what's going on. And you know, that kind of work is just very, very different than, I mean, any urban context I've seen where there's just so right. much, you know, like you disagree, well, great, go form your own group, adios, you yeah. know? You can do that. Like I, I was with some folks who were like, well, you just don't talk to Trump, I was like, if I, I if I didn't if I didn't work with Trump supporters, I wouldn't work with anybody. <laughs> like, I gotta work with people who voted different than I did. Like, you know, that's part of the work. You know, we may not vote for the same people, but we got some. We both want bail reform, and we both think this medical stuff is not working out. This right. like healthcare thing is not working out. Let's let's talk. We need schools that teach our kids. Like, there's just bottom lines. I don't think our stories are told very often by media. I mean, I, I know Appalachia right now, there's a big focus on Appalachia again since the election. And um, one thing that my friend Willa Johnson, who um, works at Apple Shop with uh, the Appalachian Media Institute, brought up at one point was that um, anytime there are like minority groups in the country talking about like Black Lives Matter or like 
hey, yeah, Black Lives Matter, there is a lot of pointing to like, but what about these poor white folks? And Appalachia gets the attention again, mm -hmm. you know? Or like, think about civil rights movement in the 60s, and it's like, but what about these poor white folks? War on poverty. But like, they never do anything for us. It's just like, Appalachia is used as this way to like, look at and be like, but look at these people, they're struggling. Or like, Trump's declaration about opioids, he's not putting any money behind it. It's a very much, but look at these poor white folks thing that is happening. And I think that that is often the only media that happens around this region. I mean, there's just so much around, uh, you know, that so much of work, the work we do is really rooted in connecting people because they feel so deeply, deeply isolated. And I feel like that is very much what I'm hearing and feeling from rural folks all over. You know, especially after the election, we just got calls from just about every state in the country from folks who are like, you have rural in your name, do you work in my state? I'm just so desperate to figure out like who my people are. And you know, there's such a sense of fear and dread and you know, ice raids and the FBI door knocking on Muslim folks' doors and all of that has really, folks really reeling and desperate for community. And if we're not actually sharing what we have learned, including what has not worked, yeah. <laughs> of which, you know, um, it's hard to find movement spaces where there's not so much ego that you can't talk about that. And that's something that's so beautiful about SMA because it's really rooted in what are we trying to build? And we have to reflect on what we've done in order to go forward. As a young person here, like I didn't, I didn't think I was Appalachian. Like I didn't know like I was Appalachian and I didn't know I could be Appalachian I, that I could be queer. I didn't know I could be a queer Appalachian. I didn't know those identities could intersect because I didn't see that. Because if you read anything about Appalachia in the media, it's like, they don't mention queer folks. They don't talk about queer folks, they don't talk about people of color, and mm -hmm. there's only so many times that you're erased from the narrative that you, don't, you start feeling like you don't belong here. When I first started working with the STAY Project, I was a volunteer, and my first STAY meeting was at the Highlander Center, and I met these really wonderful people like Ash Henderson and Kendall Bilbrey, who opened up my whole world. And it was the first time I knew that you could be working on environmental issues and social justice issues and that like you, you could do them all at once. They were all connected. And I was like, well, duh. But like, here is an example of people doing it. And this is like, this is amazing. And it's happening here, like in this space that in these mountains that I love. And that meeting grounded me in knowing that I could come home because they were the first people that told me you can come home and it's okay to want to come home. And I traveled across the country and all over the United States. And um, the whole time I like, was going to these places that were amazing and, and wonderful. Um, and I was meeting cool people and I was like, I could do some organizing here, but what would it be for? Like, it's not for my home. Like, I want to go home and do the work that matters to me in my home because it's important to me for my home to be a place that I can stay in and that I can live in and it, to be the, like these other places, like, like when I went and visited Portland and Bellingham and Washington and, and, and Seattle, Washington. I was like, there's cool stuff here, but like, why, why am I not working to make that cool st stuff happen in my home? Like, that's what was really important to me. Besides stay existing in general, I mean, that was created by young people for young people. It's an autonomous youth space. And so like its existence is pretty incredible. And like we fundraised by ourselves to create a full-time position for a young person in Appalachia with benefits. So like that's an incredible, like amazing thing that has allowed me to stay and allowed a per the person who had the job before me to stay. And it is set up to be something that trans that is like transitional and can trans like we can transition that to another young person in a short period of time. So that's pretty amazing with STAY. Another work that we've been involved with, STAY has been involved with, but just in general, um, is the rural broadband work um, in East Tennessee. And basically, we, we started with this group, SEED, Sustainable and Equitable Agricultural Development, working on land issues. But we realized pretty quickly we couldn't do anything around economic development or land or anything because nobody had internet access. You can't bring economic development in if you don't have internet. In some places we're working with the tower and other places we're working with electric cooperatives to provide internet access. And then other places we're working with a small internet provider to meet up with another internet provider and provide for this one community that only has satellite internet. 
this is back in 2011. Uh, we got word actually from a couple of small towns that there were many, many post offices across rural Oregon that were facing closure and they were all in towns of 100 to 400 people. So we were reaching out to these communities being like, so we're in the heat of the Occupy moment. What are you gonna do about your post office closing? If you are in the mountains, like the coastal ranges feels very similar to Appalachia in terms of rolling hills and you don't have cell reception and folks have phone lines that haven't been repaired since the 50s so they have no dial up and so folks were really reliant on the postal service for doing everything. After we did some work around post offices, we did these meetings in communities just to sit down and be like, so let's connect the dots between the post offices and what else is going on in the community. I was in the general store, I was expecting six people, but 38 people came. And they said that there had never been a community meeting. Folks started naming that they, like folks in the community couldn't actually afford to pick their kids up after school. And so they were coming home on the bus and their grades were dropping because they didn't have any real access to internet. Like folks were barely had power, wasn't on reliably because they couldn't afford the bills, you know, that kind of stuff. The general store was like, huh, you don't have internet? We have high speed here. I don't know why. Seems like they ran it out here on their way out to the coast. And so we started problem solving. Well, what would it look like to get some computers in here? And the general store was like, huh, anything that increases business, sure. So what we did is we have a nonprofit in Portland so called Free Geek, and they do refurbished computers. So we got a couple of refurbished computers and set them up in the Swiss Home General Store. And so folks had access to these computers so they could go in there and do their homework. They could go in there, you know, find housing, apply to jobs, you know, the kind of things that people go to libraries in small towns for, but these were such small towns that they had lost every scrap of infrastructure. We had this community meeting where they were like, what if we had a newsletter? And the postmaster was like, well, I will deliver those. I'll put them in everyone's P.O. box. So oh. everyone will have access to this newsletter that we print. Computers in a general store, it just opened everything up. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. What does it actually mean to be in a community where you walk into town and you know everyone? And if you holler somewhere in town, someone's gonna stop and help you. And frankly, the organizing that I was really raised in is just so intuitive to me where folks really show up for each other because that's what you do in communities like folks are like fiercely independent but also fiercely interdependent and it's just uh, really powerful when someone's in need folks really show up for each other When they were still high school seniors, Winona Go and Priya Volci set out to talk with people about race, not what they'd learned in Black History Month or from TV or textbooks, but their personal experiences. They ended up creating what they call the Classroom Index. The dynamic duo were speakers at the TED Women Conference in New Orleans this fall, where we had a chance to talk. Many thanks to TED Women for their help with this segment. Growing up as two young women of color, um, race was really part of our lives, right? And I think throughout almost all of our education, early education, middle school, first two years of high school, we never talked about race. And then sophomore year after the summer of Eric Garner and Ferguson was the first time that we ever talked about race in mm -hmm. school. And I think for the two of us, it just prompted a lot of, of curiosity and this feeling like we really, we had these experiences, but we really didn't know anything about race. So we started talking to all these random people in Princeton. We would literally go to Nassau Street, the downtown street in Princeton. We'd tap somebody on the shoulder. We'd be like, hey, do you have a story about race to share? We're two high school students um, putting together a collection of stories. And then we put it on our website, princetonchoose.org. You'd be surprised by how many people are actually willing to open up to us and have these like deeply intimate conversations about their childhood, how race has played a role in their lives. And we feel like a lot of that has to do with because people don't have that opportunity Otherwise, throughout their whole lives, we didn't talk about race until high school. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like releasing this burden off of their shoulders. We actually read some books like um, The K or like Huck Finn, you know, that right. talked about race and like black people. Or we talked about historical events like slavery, Jim Crow, mm -hmm. that also talked about, um, you know, oppression of black people right. in America. But I feel like the thing is like with books, it's like this happened in this fiction world. And with right. history, it's like this happened decades ago. So none of it's like this is a problem today, right? Like race today is not 
not really a thing, none and we never, we never felt that. Right, none of it is put in, in a modern context, so part of the power of our stories, we feel like, is when you introduce them into the classroom and kids see a face, it could be their neighbor, someone in town they've seen before, someone who works at a store they like to shop in, and they suddenly feel this relevancy. You think we've talked to like over a thousand people, right, right. and interviewed them, and you think like talking about race, it must be all the same thing, it must get old, but no, every single person we talk to, almost every single person, there's like a new story, there's new experiences right. that we've never heard about before so we're we're always learning in Tahlequah Oklahoma again we end up in the most random places by just luck I feel like sometimes and we interviewed the student Ayoka she started talking about her personal experiences we were completely blown away she told us that she is the one of the youngest speakers of the Cherokee language mm -hmm. um, and the how or in yeah area, in her local area language. and how her fluency in Cherokee means so much to her personally because she's a trans woman and the Cherokee language is non-gendered so she was allowed to move without any obstructions literally in the language and in the culture of her Cherokee heritage. What we didn't talk about in our talk is another aspect of intersectionality right. that she's actually the leader of a Catholic organization on her yeah. campus and she's talking about religion and how that intersects with with gender and sexuality and, right. and race and ability and all of these different identities. Right. Um, and and so, so she was talking about what the disappearance of her language is also the disappearance of like that part of her identity which was like fostered so well in the mm -hmm. Cherokee language. When we go and interview all of these people individually and we mull over their experiences and think about it and then the next day we like Google something or do some research on like what their personal experiences mean, how it's significant in a larger picture. Yes, this was a woman we met. Um, in Chicago, her name was Lisa, and she was just talking about, you know, and I, I remember listening to her story, it was so powerful because she was so emotional, she was talking in tears, you know, right. not necessarily about her own personal experiences being called the dirty Jew and that kind of thing growing up and her grandfather being a Holocaust survivor and that kind of thing, but talking about her own students and how every day she worked with these primarily low-income black students who came in with all these different racial realities that she was disconnected from and learning to listen to their experiences, right? We interviewed a White, another white teacher in um, in in Omaha, Mrs. Busby, who was telling us that many of her students don't come back alive to her, mm -hmm. um, and she was talking about how she has dedicated herself to this work so strongly because she makes such a difference in the lives of those students by giving them hope and counseling and a person to trust and and be comfortable with, um, and I think that's so important and speaks to how we share that story of Lisa because we're trying to 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 point to the idea of that. Um, you know, if you have white privilege, you can really, really leverage it for something good and for social justice, right. just like Lisa did. A man named Choi Chi, and he was a Japanese internment camp survivor, and he was talking about actually solidarity with right. natives during that time and the experiences right. with food and how he can't eat the food that, that he remembers the smells from, from the internment camps, and it was just really touching. Right. So that was all in one day, and so the diverse experiences we're collecting um, all across the country has really blown us away. I think so much of it has been like, I think in a point of, in our lives, especially during high school, we had collected hundreds of stories and we were like, we are at a point of racial literacy, but part of it has been realizing that we still have so much to learn and these stories are starting points to learning about like the systemic injustices that exist. And I think it's been really interesting to interact with all these people and understand like the nuanced um, racial realities that exist in our country. Yeah, I think in our TED Talk we talked about how racism is this nationwide epidemic that we can't recognize or get rid of. And I think that idea about recognition, we don't understand who we are yet, so we can't tackle the problem in a way that's effective. The whole point of our talk was raising the bar for racial literacy, right? The idea that we don't understand who we are and we need to keep learning. In our book, in the first book, The Classroom Index, we would take all of these personal stories and literally pull out lines where they're talking about systemic injustices. Maybe not literally, so say we interviewed someone on the street and they're talking about their own personal experience with police brutality. We would back it up with stats in the book to show how it's a larger systemic issue and not just one isolated incident. Once you become racially literate and that includes caring so deeply about the issue that you're compelled to do something about it, right. then you can take action in your, in your home community, in your local communities, yeah, that every small thing counts, the idea that every person, no matter what your profession or background is, right. can somehow bring justice, racial justice specifically, to the conversation, to the table, to the work. Yeah. Um, and that everybody can leverage their personal skills for the cause of social and racial justice. 
I think it's really interesting when we started in sophomore year, racial literacy was not really a term at all, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the focus investing on listening to students of color's experiences was not something popular, it was not something normalized. And I think over the past few years, not, re not really because of us, but because of all the activists in the all community. The activists, yeah, yeah, all the students, all the adults, professionals, professors from the university, parents, all of that have really come together and tried to really start learning and listening now first. A racial literacy course at our school. Racial literacy course yeah. at our school, which has been awesome. Really and it's been a journey it. for us working with the administration right. of our school and, and learning from them and working with them. If you like that segment and want more commentary from me, sign up to become a monthly member on our site and receive exclusive access to extra content just for you. Don't forget to follow us on social media and write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com. Until next week, I'm Laura Flanders. Thanks.